Hello, friends. Welcome to Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Assa. I want to dis- discuss with you what we see here. Source apportionment of methane escaping the subsea permafrost system in the outer Eurasian Arctic Shelf. And you can see the, these are the, uh, the investigators, the authors on this uh, research report. And it's in the, from the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences of USA. Now, they get extremely technical in this uh, paper here. And I'm not going to go into the weeds with it here. What I will do is I will leave uh, a link to the URL, or the URL link to this article, in the comments section below the video. So if you are interested in getting into the weeds, uh, look for for those comments, click on the link, and it will take you here, and you can then study it in depth at your own leisure. But what I do want to discuss with you is basically the overall findings here and the implications of that. I also, th- this article caught my attention because for those of you who watch my ocean heat content video, I hypothesize that I wonder if, you know, the warming water being brought into the Arctic Ocean, if like the warming air thawing out the permafrost in the Arctic where the methane is being released into the atmosphere directly, I was hypothesizing that a similar process warming water would start thawing out the substrate in the, for example, the the shelf system, thereby helping to promote further increases of methane. It appears that uh, this is part of what they found, though the source of it, as I understand it in the article, did come as a surprise. More on that in a bit. So, they uh, sum up the significance of this uh, paper, or maybe the journal did. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, excessive release of methane from sediments of the world's largest continental shelf, the East Siberian Arctic Ocean, ESAO for short, is one of the few Earth system processes that can cause a net transfer of carbon from land ocean to the atmosphere and thus amplify global warming on the time scale of this century. An important gap in our current knowledge concerns the contributions of different subsea pools to the observed methane releases. This knowledge is a prerequisite to robust predictions, in other words, good predictions, on how these releases will develop in the future. Triple isotope-based fingerprinting of the origin of the highly elevated ESAO methane levels points to a limited contribution from shallow microbial sources and instead a dominating contribution from a deep thermogenic pool. This right here, a limited contribution from shallow microbial sources. That surprised me. I I was expecting that that would be a a greater contribution. Now note, they're not saying microbial sources did not contribute, simply not at high levels, but they still did contribute. They talk about dominating contribution from deep thermogenic pools. Now thermogenic, thermal means, uh, you know, heat, and genic genesis, right? So the heat beginnings. Basically, is uh, geological processes that occur deep down and it's influenced by heat and pressure and that kind of stuff where the geology is altered, chemical reactions take place without the aid of biological agents. So in other words, the methane that results from the deep thermogenic pool is the result of abiotic processes. That's what I mean. So compare thermogenic to biogenic, 
biogenic is you know self-explanatory so and spoiler alert but i'll basically cut right through it here when they talk about the deep thermogenic pool is that they are finding fractures in the substrate that from where the methane is leaking but the fractures are resulting from the warming from the warmer waters interacting with the substrate causing the fractures causing but what they call chimneys or pipes for which the methane can then find a way like a vent to release itself the water the warmer water is having an effect that's basically what they were finding in this study here okay so let's go through the uh the abstract here okay. and that's this bit right there the east siberian arctic shelf holds large amounts of inundated carbon and methane holocene warming by overlying seawater recently fortified by anthropogenic warming has caused thawing of the underlying sea subsea permafrost so basically they are saying what i the basic verify what i hypothesize that the warmer water is causing thawing of the permafrost despite extensive observations of elevated uh, seawater methane in the past decades that means methane dissolved in the water relative contributions from different subsea compartments such as early diagenesis which is the process of you know transforming geological uh, uh, factors and species and so forth subsea permafrost methane hydrates underlying thermogenic slash free gas to these methane releases remain elusive so what they tried to do in this paper was they tried to identify where was the methane coming from was it coming from the subsea permafrost the hydrates or deep down thermogenic free and that kind of stuff so they're trying to pinpoint that in order to improve modeling to get a handle on the you know the amounts the uh, that uh, trapped uh, what would be the rate of release all those kind of uh, unknowns dissolved methane concentrations observed in the laptop c range from three to 1500 nanomoles nm the median was 151 nanomoles over saturation by about 3800 percent okay now a mole okay this is like molarity if i have you know a, a sodium has a molecular weight of 23 and i'm, I'm just using rounded numbers and chlorine has a molecular uh, excuse me i should say atomic weight sodium has an atomic weight of 23 uh, chlorine atomic weight of 35. so if i form sodium chloride okay the molecular weight now would be 58. We're talking about atomic mass units well if i take 58 grams of sodium chloride and i dissolve it in one liter of water i have a one molar solution of sodium chloride well a nanomole is basically one billionth of a mole so one way of saying is take the 58 grams of sodium chloride and dissolve it in one billion liters or take 58 nanograms and dissolve it in one liter a little difficult to measure out nanograms but you get the idea so doesn't sound like a lot but it's there okay methane stable isotopic composition showed strong vertical horizontal gradients with source signatures for two seepage areas of del 13 cch4 okay and they give you the the fractionation values okay del 13 isotopic signatures they're using isotopic signatures to identify the source and then they talk about a triple isotopic signature process which um you know i'm not a chemist so it's not my area of expertise i'm basically a fluid dynamicist and i did heat budgets okay but what they we found with the result was a thermogenic natural gas source increasingly uh, enriched 
uh, Dell 13 and a Dell D at distance from the seeps indicated methane oxidation. Methane, you recall, oxidizes into CO2. The Del 14 signal was strongly depleted, that is old, near the seeps. Hence, all three isotope systems are consistent with methane released from an old, deep, and likely thermogenic pool to the outer Laptev C. Okay, so the, apparently the triple isotope is looking at the Del 13, the Del D, which I would imagine is D for deuterium, and the Delta 14. So that seems to be the three, uh, what they're looking at. This knowledge of what subsea sources are contributing to the observed methane releases is a prerequisite to predictions on how these emissions will increase over coming decades and centuries. They didn't sugarcoat it. So yeah, methane releases are going to increase. So all those people who kept dumping on Natalia Shakova and Igor Similatov, I think they owe those two fine researchers an apology. The East Siberian Arctic Shelf, ESAS is the world's largest and shallowest shelf sea system formed through inundation of Northeast Siberia during sea level transgression in the early Holocene. Uh, translation, ice sheets melted, it, the, the oceans filled up. And, and what was an exposed uh, flat region got covered. And the ESAS holds substantial but poorly constrained amounts of organic carbon and methane. Poorly constrained means that it can be readily released. These carbon methane stores are contained in unknown partitions as gas hydrates, unfrozen sediments, subsea permafrost, gas pockets within and below the subsea permafrost, and as underlying thermogenic gas. That means, that means the source is much deeper. If you were to go vertically through the, the geological column, the thermogenic gas would be deeper down. Methane released through the atmosphere from these compartments could potentially have significant effects on the global climate, yet there are large uncertainties regarding the size and vulnerability toward remobilization of these inaccessible and elusive subsea carbon methane pools. You have heard me say before, what concerns a lot of the uh, scientists is how much methane there is, the total amount and at what rate at what rate will they be will this methane be released from these various uh, locations conceptual development and modeling have predicted a warming of the esas system by a combination of geothermal heat and climate driven holocene heat flux from overlying seawater recently further enhanced by Anthropocene warming may lead to thawing of the subsea permafrost. There it is, right there. And subsea permafrost drilling in the Laptev Sea has recently confirmed that the subsea permafrost has indeed come near the point of thawing. Basically, all hell's gonna break loose. In addition to mobilization, i.e. release, of the carbon methane stored within the subsea permafrost, its degradation can also lead to the formation of pathways for gaseous methane from underlying reservoirs, including further methane release to the overlying water column. This is the reference to the thermogenic gas. In other words, you, you can degrade all the way down through the, uh, the geological column, helping to release basically to trap gas down there. Okay, continue on. Near annual ship-based expedition to the ESAS. Uh, that's a reference to Igor. In the, and I've shared with you some of his findings there, right? Over the past two decades have documented widespread seep locations with extensive methane releases to the water column. Methane levels are often found to be 10 to 100 times higher than the atmospheric equilibrium so now there's not an equilibrium and more is being added to the system and are particularly elevated in areas of strong 
uh, ebu, uh, ebulush, ebullition, I think is how it's pronounced, from subsea gas seeps or methane hotspots. Uh, evolution is basically violent eruptions. So when I showed you that video of all the, you know, that methane bubbling up to the, you know, to the surface, that's what this is. That's the uh, ebullition, uh, yeah, however that's pronounced. Okay, so that, that's what it is, violent methane eruptions, uh, eruptions in gaseous forms, as opposed to being dissolved in the water. So when the dissolved methane is, uh, starts to be above equilibrium, it's going to bubble out of solution and then and then go into the gaseous free gaseous state and then eventually find its way to the uh, atmosphere. Similarly, elevated uh, dissolved methane concentrations in bottom waters appear to be spatially related to the thermal state of the subsea permafrost as deduced from modeling results and or geophysical uh, surveys. And they go on to say that they lack knowledge on the quantitative or even relative contributions of the different subsea pools to the observed methane release. And that's, of course, a requirement for being able to make better predictions and uh, projections as to what the concentrations are, what the release will be, and what the uh, what it'll do for uh, methane levels. An important distinction needs to be made between pools that release methane gradually, such as methane produced microbially in shallow sediments during early diagenesis, or in thawing uh, subsea permafrost versus pools with preformed methane that may release more abruptly once pathways are available, such as from disintegrating methane hydrates and pools of thermogenic natural gas below the subsea permafrost. And then they say multidimensional isotope analysis offers a useful means to sort this all out. So they say stable isotope data using DEL-13 and DEL-D, again, I'm going to deuterium most likely, provide useful information on methane formation and removal pathways. The radiocarbon content of methane, delta-14, helps to determine the age and methane source reservoir. And then they link you to a, an appendix there. So they present isotope-based apportionment and so on and so forth. As I said, I'm not going to get into the weeds here because this is really quite wonky. What I will show you is the study site, which is right here. So here's the Arctic Ocean. Here is this gray color. That's that shelf system they're talking about here. So uh, over here is the Bering Straits, the Chukchi Beaufort over here. Here's the East Siberian Sea. Here's the Laptev, the Kara, and the Barents Sea. So this uh, red box here, that's this here. This is basically the study site. And this is kind of at the... Um, towards the edge of the shelf, where it starts to get into the deeper um, waters. Uh, this palish line right there, that's the Lomonosov Ridge. So you got the um, Eurasian Basin, the Amerasian Basin, and so forth uh, being separated there. Okay, so, um, and then they also list the dissolve uh, methane in bottom water. Now, the bottom water, the samples are taken at five meters above the substrate and given in nanometers. So wherever they measure these, here are the results, 4 to 10, 10 to 25, etc. Black is greater than 1,000 uh, nanomoles. So you can almost say uh, one uh, micromole because 1,000 nanos equals one micro. This graph here just shows some, you know, horizontal distributions of stuff. And then they, what they did was they combined uh, the results and discussions uh, in, in these sections here. And they talk about, you know, what they were fi finding at the, the various uh, locations, horizontal bottom water profiles, bubble plumes, identified by the mid-water echo sound that strongly suggested uh, uh, ebullition from the sediment seeps 
as the predominant source of methane to the water column. With you. Processes affecting spatial distribution of water column methane. Okay, let's uh, look at this paragraph here. Methane concentrations and isotopic signatures in the ESAS seawater are generally influenced by a mixture of sources and uh, degradation processes. The presence of an ebullition uh, transported subsea source of sea site is clearly visible from the distribution of methane concentrations, both vertical horizontal profiles, as well as from looking at the sonar documented uh, ebullition. Ebullition can effectively transport methane through the pycnocline to the water surface. Now, the pycnocline, right, it's a change in density. If the methane is staying in solution, dissolved, the pycnocline will serve as a barrier or definitely minimize any seepage through the pycnocline to shallower water uh, layers. But when you, ebullition is basically an eruption, a gaseous eruption, and that apparently can go right through the pycnocline to the water surface. And that's what I was showing to you in that video with the methane plumes. Vertical profiles closest to the seep show concentration maxima at the bottom and mid-water maximum for most of the other stations. The latter may reflect the accumulation of upward diffusing methane at the pycnocline. Okay, that's just what I was referring to, a slow diffusion through the pycnocline, whereas the gaseous eruption will just blast right through the pycnocline. The vertical distribution of dissolved methane likely Note, dissolved methane likely reflects continuous dissolution of methane from the bubbles into the water column, the vertical concentration profiles, and the timing of methane venting to the atmosphere are also affected by water column mixing and changes in meteorological conditions and, you know, changes in water temperature. As an example, remember, gas solubility is inversely related to water temperature. So the relative magnitude of these... Uh, gaseous eruptions and dissolution vectors is however difficult to assess without quantitative measurements of the amount of bubbles and their methane content so what the and i'll go on again the presence of bubbles can also influence the observed isotopic signatures dissolved methane gaseous methane would be altered to different degrees by methane oxidation as that process only affects methane in dissolved forms now what they're kind of saying is that there might be some bubble, small bubble seepage out of the substrate, which is which then dissolves in the water. Where, but if you have this gaseous eruption, it's just so much of it that it doesn't dissolve in water and just travels upward as a big, as a big fart, basically. Methane oxidation and these numbers here, like that, that's the uh, referencing other researchers here, is a likely explanation for the extremely enriched positive del 13 signatures at the couple of the stations here these values correlate with relatively lower ch4 concentration consistent with the oxidation of a large fraction of the methane leaving the residual dissolved pool heavily enriched such highly enriched stable isotopic signatures due to oxidation are unusual but have been reported elsewhere this strong enrichment implies long residence time because if the methane is hanging out there for a long time, it's going to be oxidized. Which may be achieved in the system by residing in the surface sediment, basically anaerobic oxidation, or in the water column, aerobic oxidation. In other words, what they're saying is through anaerobic uh, means, the methane becomes CO2. In the water column, Aerobic means the methane becomes CO2. So either way, so whether methane you know, gets released to the atmosphere or not, it's being changed into CO2, which does will eventually do get its way into the atmosphere. So when people say, well, the methane release is insignificant, some, some researchers are arguing that, what they're failing to miss is that how much of those met of the CO2 that is being uh, sampled and measured and so forth, how much of that CO2 is from the oxidation of methane versus just CO2? So to me, that's kind of a, 
a big question mark. What is the source of the CO2? Is it CO2, you know, from basic aerobic processes, for example, or is it the oxidation of methane? Such that the methane changes the CO2 and it gives the false notion that, oh, there's not much methane, you know, in the atmosphere, whereas it could have, the CO2, some of it could have originally been methane. So that to me is a big uh, uh, piece of information that needs to be filled in. This altered methane is thus not traceable to a specific local source, hence some of the uncertainties, but is the product of a series of mixing alteration processes during several year long circulation on the ESAF, circulation referring to uh, current movements. The presence of such a degradation process complicates stable isotope based source apportionment of dissolved methane. Delta 14 is per definition unaffected by isotope fractionation. Therefore, isotopic fingerprinting of the sources of the bottom escaping methane focus on the samples closest to the seeps because that apparently their method is able to identify that better. Okay, they do some keeling plots, which I will admit I am unfamiliar with, but looking at the graph, it appears to be graphing uh, some fractionation against uh, the, the concentration. And the, the solid line is the fit line, the dashed lines are the errors. And I think, I seem to recall they did not find a very good uh, correlation. And want to look at this paragraph here. The presence of thermogenic source pool beneath our study area is consistent with results by Kramer and Frank based on their observations of hydrocarbon concentration and their Del-13 in absorbed uh, gases in the sediment. The existence of pathways to transport methane from these deep sources to the water column in our study area is also consistent with recent seismic data, which shows about 500 meter wide gas conduits in the sediment correlating with a fault zone and cut through the neogene secession in the basement. I guess that's the neogene is a uh, geological formation. 500 meter wide, not insignificant. Further support for a migratory inflow of petroleum hydrocarbons from below is also given by a recent biomarker uh, st uh, study in the studied seep area. So they talk about petrogenic, which implies petroleum source. So they found in the surface sediment of the study seep area a significant difference between the seepage area and the background areas. Taken together, the triple isotopes and these other ancillary data are consistent with the deep thermogenic source of methane. So basically what they're saying is the methane that they're finding, the methane that's being released, the majority of it is coming from uh, deep in the, in the rock, in the ground. So it's thermogenic, not necessarily biogenic. They also seem to be saying, implying that the thermogenic releases are greater than biogenic releases and therefore has a higher uh, amount, a higher concentration, what they're basically saying. Ah, here's an interesting. Indications of leakage from this source to the water column were seen in the Del-13 signatures as in contrast to microbial typical signatures dominating in the inner shelf. That is very important. Makes a distinction here. Based on Del-13 and Del-deuterium isotope data, uh, Sapert et al. suggested an old Pleistocene methane source, but of microbial origin for the innermost uh, southeast Laptev Sea. So in other words, what they're saying is that if you're close in to the shelf, in other words, the shelf closer to the shoreline, the methane from there is probably biogenic in source, whereas the further you go out, it's more thermogenic. It kind of makes sense because the shelf does gradually get, get deeper and deeper. So this makes perfect sense. So what they're finding is that the outer shelf, just before it becomes a slope, is that it's a thermogenic source, whereas other studies indicated that closer to shore, there is a biogenic source for the methane. So, you, so it's not one or the other, it's both. 
Modification of methane originated from an old sedimentary source. It was also indicated on the other side of the Arctic Ocean on the U.S. Beaufort Shelf using delta-14 uh, carbon. Sparrow et al. estimated significant contribution, 45 to 86 percent of ancient sources of methane found in waters, yet much lower dissolved methane concentrations are observed on the American shelves than what is found on the ESAS. Now, when I talk about ancient sources, this is basically, you know, all the carbon that got trapped, all the, you know, because the permafrost has typically been a carbon sink. We have all this old carbon from earlier time, you know, or the carbon material died, that's compacted, that kind of stuff. We now know that the permafrost and basically the Arctic whether land or sea, is now becoming a carbon source, no longer a carbon sink. So this, when they talk about ancient sources, it's, it's the old carbon sink material that's now finding itself becoming a source. And this would be a summation here. Taken together, the triple isotope data presented here in combination with other system uh, data and uh, indications from earlier studies suggest that deep thermogenic reservoirs are key sources of the elevated methane concentrations in the outer Laptev Sea. These, this finding is essential in several ways. Okay, So this is the outer Laptev. It appears to be biogenic for the inner Laptev. The occurrence of elevated levels of radiocarbon depleted methane in the water column may be an indication of thawing subsea permafrost in the study area. They say, however, the triple isotope fingerprint suggests, fingerprinting suggests, right, del-13 carbon, delta-14 carbon, and del-deuterium, that methane may not primarily originate directly from the subsea permafrost. The continuous leakage of an old geological reservoir to the water column suggests the existence of perforations in the subsea permafrost serving as conduits of deeper methane to gas charged shallow sediments. In other words, fi they're finding a way to vent. Second, the finding that methane re is released from a large pool of preformed methane as opposed to methane from slow decomposition of thawing subsea permafrost organic matter suggests that these releases may be more eruptive in nature which provides a larger potential for abrupt future releases. More triple isotope, that, you know, basically saying they need more, uh, more studies, more information. And then finally, the improved quantitative constraints on the relative importance of different subsea sources in ESAS and their variability represent a substantial step in our understanding of the system and thus toward credible predictions predictions, projections of how these Arctic methane releases will develop in the future. So, to, and then they go into an extensive materials and methods uh, section, which again, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can study that. I will leave the URL uh, link in the comments section. So basically, to kind of sum this up, they use uh, three different isotopic measurements a del-13 fractionation of carbon, a del deuterium, deuterium is heavy hydrogen, and then delta-14 carbon. And what they basically found is that on the outer left hep C, there's a thermogenic, primarily a thermogenic source of methane with apparently a, abrupt uh, releases of gas that it does not dissolve in the water column, it blows through the water column, makes it into the atmosphere. That's what, uh, you know, some of the things that Igor was documenting in that video I shared with you, you know, methane releases. But there is still a biogenic source. It appears to be uh, lesser in the outer lab C, but on the inner lab C, biogenic seems to be uh, a higher contributor there, more so than thermogenic. So what they're basically saying is that the thermogenic is deep down and the warming of the water most likely is helping to thaw out the subsea permafrost and 
Whereas, you know, when it's not thawed out, it serves as a cap. You thaw that out there, and now the methane's got to wait to release itself. And they said that, you know, they have some pipes and, and it, methane can easily vent. Now, when I have little seepages, the little seepages can dissolve in the water column. Okay, fine. But when you have these big eruptions, it's just too much to dissolve in the water column and just blast its way through the pycnocline, et cetera, to the surface. So thermogenic, being aided by warm waters, helping to thaw out the subsea permafrost, giving conduits for it to escape, in addition to the biogenic processes, which the contribution is of a lesser amount, but the processes are still taking place. So we have biogenic processes, not only in the terrestrial permafrost, but also in the you know, oceanic permafrost, all contributing methane. And as I cautioned earlier, methane oxidizes into CO2, so we need better uh, representation of when we look at the CO2, perhaps we look at the isotopic signature, is the source aerobic or is the so a source methanogenic? In other words, from methane oxidizing down. So these people who dismissed Shakova's and Semelotov's work mm, think that I think they were wrong. Let's just I'm being I'm trying to put this nicely. So I, you know, I looked at this here because it's basically kind of confirming my hypothesis that the warmer waters can help thaw out the subsea permafrost allowing for increased methane to escape you know as i stated in my ocean heat content video so basically what's the upshot of all this expect more methane releases either slowly by biogenic processes or eruptions but methane releases will continue methane concentrations will continue to increase and of course, we know what the implications are of that. So I thank you for your time and we'll talk soon. Hello folks, this is Jim here with Science Talk asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.